I'm here. I'm here. I, oh, Jesus. Jesus. I'm here. I'm here, Richard. I'm so sorry I'm late. Uh, there was a, I mean, the traffic. You would not believe my rat. What? Was I late because I was playing too much Baldur's Gate 3? This guy, this guy, please. I am a professional, Richard, okay? You think I would be late to a shoot, a scheduled shoot, because I was playing some silly video game? Come on. The very fact that you would think I am capable of that offends me more deeply than you could possibly know. I have never been so insulted. I have never been so... What? What was I doing? I mean, I was, I was, I mean this is a very good explanation for that. I was playing to Mario 3. Hmm? I was playing Baldur's Gate 3. When you first start playing, Baldur's Gate 3 seems pretty straightforward. You hit the bad guys more than they hit you, and you win. Sure, it gets a little more complicated with different classes and abilities, but all in all, not that hard until they start throwing like 45 goblins at you at once and then you're fighting for your life out there in real life, it's crazy. Oftentimes, the key to success in this game can be a matter of simply bringing the right people to the job. Baldur's Gate 3 has a plethora of different companions with their own classes, skills, and abilities that you can take with you into battle. But the more I played, the more I realized that not all companions are created equal and making choices is hard. So that got me thinking, instead of spending all this time strategizing and thinking ahead before every combat, what if I just found the best overall companions and just bring them every single time while everyone else warms the bench? Now that sounds like a proper plan to me. But to do that, we first need to answer this very important question. Which Baldur's Gate 3 companion is statistically the strongest. Richard, hit that intro. Look, I'm sorry, I was doing research. There are a total of 10 possible party members that you can recruit throughout Baldur's Gate 3, excluding, of course, whatever abomination you cooked up in the character creator to absolutely ruin any serious moments, as any true gamer would. The first six companions are super easy to get. The game basically just drip feeds them to you throughout the first few hours of the game. First, we have Astarian the Rogue. Now, rogues in these types of games tend to have a reputation for being these morally gray edgelords who are actually just straight up evil, but they're also hot so they can get away with it. But Astarian is actually exactly that. He's a sarcastic vampire who gets mad at you whenever you decide to not punt an old lady down the stairs. Shadowheart is a cleric who is 100% an occult. Gale is a narcissistic wizard who's way too easy to romance. Calm down, bro. Lazelle is a fighter who is mean, that's basically it. Will is a warlock who's basically a superhero straight out of Marvel Comics, and Karlak is a barbarian who says fuck a lot. Hell yeah! There's also four more people that you can recruit as the story progresses. House and the Druid starts as an NPC quest giver, but will eventually join you in Act 2. He can also turn into a bear. If you've seen any of the discourse around this game, you know what that means. Jahira is also a druid that you can recruit in also Act 2, like very shortly after Hausen. Not really sure why they didn't just make her a monk or a sorcerer or some other class that hasn't been used yet, but that's fine. Then there's this drow paladin who, I'll be honest, I had no idea you could recruit her until I started researching for this video. She's one of the leaders of the Cult of the Absolute, who you're tasked with killing in Act 1. I guess if you talk to her, you can convince her to join you. Look, I'll be frank, I completely assassinated her from the shadows at the first available moment without a second thought, so I really couldn't tell you a single thing about her. And then lastly, there's Minsk, the Human Ranger. I haven't gotten to the part of the game where you can get him, but I mean, he kind of looks like Kratos, so that's pretty cool. So that's all the options we have. Now it's time to rank them. To do that, we're gonna be using my old favorite method on this channel. You know it, you love it. It's the decision matrix.
For those who don't know, the decision matrix is something used in engineering to objectively rank stuff based on a bunch of different criteria without any bias. So just know that when your best girl ends up getting last place, it's nothing personal. You're just objectively wrong. The first step in the decision matrix process is to select our criteria, basically all the factors that we want to judge these characters on. We're going to be doing some math with these later on, so all these criteria need to be expressed with numbers. Luckily, Baldur's Gate 3 is a tactics RPG, so you already know it's got numbers coming out its butt. The most obvious place to start is with base stats. There are six main stats in the game that contribute to different aspects, all ranging from 1 to 20. If we go full Pokemon up in here and add each character's six stat scores together, we can find their base stat total. Now, this being an RPG where they want to incentivize you to use whatever party members you want, it makes sense that every character has around the same base stat total, just distributed differently to make them unique. Psych! In this game, some characters are just straight up better than others. And it's not even like a small difference either. Characters like Astarian and Karlak have a stat total of 75, while Halson has a total of 94. This dude's lowest stat is a 12 in intelligence. And intelligence is basically useless in this game. That's actually a good segue into my next point. In this game, certain stats are way more useful than others. Like I just mentioned, unless you're a wizard, intelligence barely comes up, while something like constitution determines your hit points. I don't care who you are, not dying every time a goblin smacks you is pretty important, shadow heart. Because of that, I came up with a very complicated system of weighting stats based on how useful they are to different classes and how many skills they have associated with them, only to find out that it changed literally nothing in the final rankings and it was actually pointless. So, you know, that's, uh, that's two hours I'll never get back. Oh! You there! Do you like freedom? Do you want to fight for what's right? Do you want to stop the man from trying to keep you down? Then I need your help. The cult of the absolute is trying to take over the world with a bunch of like little worm guys, I think. I'll be honest, I'm not super clear on what their plan is, but I know there's only one way to stop them. Your mission, you need to find the subscribe button below this video and you need to take it out. Don't worry, you won't miss out on a sick party member to recruit or anything crazy like that. That would be preposterous. <laughs> but you must act fast. It cannot be allowed to spread its corruption any further. You must... Wait a minute. There's one right now. Watch and learn, brother. <laughs> For the second criteria, let's look at classes. Now. Technically, you can change any character's class anytime you want by paying money to Withers. But we all know you're dirt poor after you impulse purchase that really cool cloak for Carlac and can't afford the 100 bucks. So for now, we'll only look at the standard class that each character comes with. I'm also not going to talk about any multi-classing or anything like that because I procrastinated so long playing Baldur's Gate 3 that I ran out of time. Classes are a bit harder to objectively rank than stats since each one comes with all sorts of unique class abilities that you can't directly compare with each other. I haven't played nearly enough of the game to be able to confidently come up with my own tier list or anything, but the internet sure is. So I found five different websites that all have their own tier lists, took the average score for each class across those five sites, and got the following rankings from that. If you think any of these are wrong or should be higher or lower, I don't know, just take it up with a dead guy or something. For the sake of the math later on, Paladin ranked the highest, so I gave that a score of 10, and then descending scores for every tier going down. Oh, wait, does that mean I shouldn't have absolutely annihilated the only paladin companion from the shadows before she could even perceive that I existed? Nah, it was cool, no regrets. While we're on the topic, I did the same thing for the races, though I have a feeling this one won't end up mattering a whole lot, seeing as eight of the ten companions are either humans, elves, or half-human, half-elf. I mean, seriously, where are my Gimli's at? 
For the fourth and final criteria, we'll look at proficiencies, which are basically all the skills that each character is good at outside of combat. So like, if you're trying to pick a pocket, that'll be a sleight of hand check. If you're trying to convince that person that you totally weren't trying to pick their pocket after you failed, then you better hope that you're good at deception. Characters can get proficiency in usually four to six different skills from their race, class, and background, which are basically just all the skills that they're going to reliably succeed in. There are a total of 18 skills in the game. Based on my personal experience, 11 of them are practically useless. Like seriously, I think I've had to make one arcana check throughout the whole game, and it was to learn some lore about an old wizard that I could not care less about. The only skills that come up consistently from what I found are athletics, deception, investigation, persuasion, perception, sleight of hand, and stealth. So for the skill score, I just gave each character a point for every one of these skills that they are proficient in. Okay, so we have all our criteria laid out and the data in the spreadsheet. Now comes the fun part, math. Don't you pretend otherwise, you clicked on a video about Baldur's Gate 3, I know you like to crunch the odd number here and there. First of all, before we can translate all these numbers into a final score, we have a problem. The class and race scores are all on a scale from 1 to 10, but the highest proficiency score is a 5, and the stat scores are in the 70s and 80s. To make these easier to compare, we need to standardize everything so that it's all on a scale from 1 to 10, with 10 being the best. Doing this is actually pretty simple, just look for the highest score in every given criteria, move the decimal over one place, and then divide everything in that column by that number, and you're good to go. The highest score is a 10, and everything else is scaled down accordingly. So now we have all our scores on a scale from 1 to 10, but we're not done quite yet. I'm sure you may have noticed by now, maybe you even left an angry comment without finishing the video first, but some of these criteria are more important than others. Yeah, that's right, that's right. I don't need any timestamps on comments, I see right through you. To account for this, we need to assign every criteria a weight, which is basically just a percentage of how much it matters. Since base stats have the biggest impact on a character's abilities inside and outside of combat, I weighted at the highest at 40%. Proficiencies are next at 30%. A large part of this game is exploration and talking to people, so having someone who can spot the traps or persuade that ogre not to kick the crap out of you is pretty important. Race is weighted at 20%, honestly it doesn't affect a whole lot, but it's completely locked in, unlike class. Though class is super important in battle, the fact that you can easily change it whenever you want makes the starting class a lot less important. To get us to a total of 100%, the starting class is weighted at 10%. Now all we have to do is multiply every standardized score by its respective weight, add them all together for every character, and we'll get a final score for every single companion out of 10 possible points. I've included a link to the spreadsheet in the description down below if you want to see all the stats and final rankings for every character, but since we still have some time left on this video, I'll go through some of them here for you as well. Coming in at the very bottom of the list, is dollar store Kratos himself, Minsk. True, his base stats are pretty high, but that's mostly due to his massive 17 in intelligence. And look, for a guy who runs a channel about absurd math and science and video games, it pains me to no end to say this, but as a ranger, there is literally no point to having intelligence. It is good to know though, that I can absolutely murk this companion without any regrets too, should the need arise. Just saying. Right above him is Will, which also kind of makes sense. His whole thing is being the Blade of Frontiers. He's quite literally built to be a swordsman, but let's be honest, you're just gonna spam Hex and Eldritch Blast nonstop anyway. Dude literally sold his soul to the devil and all it got him was ninth place. Big mood. Jumping up towards the top of the list, in third place overall, we have Halson. Like I mentioned earlier, he has the highest base stat total in the game, though his class and proficiencies are just okay. Change this guy to a cleric though, and you're messing somebody up. I'm not sure what god he's praying to to get those powers, but his enemies better be praying to him. 
just a smidge above Halston in second place is a Starian, owing in large part to the insane number of proficiencies he gets as a rogue, most of which are actually pretty helpful. Have him in your party and you can basically just ignore the whole trap and lock door mechanics in this game. He's reliably getting 30s on his lockpick checks. Also, if you see my last video on Baldur's Gate 3, you already know that the Thief Rogue with two levels of Barbarian build is absolutely nuts. I'll be honest, Astarian annoys the hell out of me most of the time. I really wish that he was absolute garbage so I could leave him at camp and not have to deal with his hot topic ass. But he's just too good. Look, keep your mouth shut and keep up with the stabby stabby and we'll be good to go. And last but not least, the moment you've all been waiting for, objectively, the single most powerful companion available to you in Baldur's Gate 3. In battle, outside of battle, this person can do it all. Statistically speaking, you'd be a fool not to have this character on your team 24-7. With a score of 8.3, the strongest companion in Baldur's Gate 3 is Minthara. Wait, who? Ah, shit.